Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Search Podcast. Uh, my name is Saud, and thank you for being very patient and listening to me uh, droll on and on about COVID stuff. Um, the feedback's been amazing. Feedback's always good, but but it's it's been amazing. Apart from that one time I really messed up, which we'll talk about later. Um, in general, uh, I think this started off with me just discussing some of the logistics because I was requested to, and then I, I decided to just take a couple of, of episodes and talk about uh, white belt to blue belt level stuff that we should go through. And I think that today I'm going to recap everything because my plan is to stop talking about COVID for a while and start talking about other stuff, maybe some trauma stuff, just to keep it fresh and different. So uh, today's episode will be about sort of the COVID prep series and putting it all together and, and developing these key concepts. So conceptually, the system bottlenecks are a different issue that we talked about a little bit with logistics. Uh, but the knowledge base problem with developing rapid knowledge uh, to address your patient's care centers around two different things. Organizational problems to do with system design and skills, clinical skills. Um how to address hemodynamics, how to treat a ventilator, summaries of all the guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, future directions and, and interpretations. But let's be honest, this is not the be-all and end-all of COVID stuff. This is nowhere near complete. It's probably just a very good primer. And I think that in about six months' time, I'm going to sound ridiculous listening to this. I mean, I always sound ridiculous. I always go, um, 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 um. But I will be extremely, extremely, extremely embarrassed by this, probably. However, let's just try and recap. So first, we did a lot of work on logistics and planning. We talked about setting up your ICU for upsurge capacity, uh, jerry-rigging a negative pressure isolation room, uh, using your favorite engineer at your institution, the concepts of viral filters, how to set up your shifts and how to strengthen your teams, and how to set up for PPEs, the logistics and liabilities uh, that we could be facing as we begin to restrict our practices, how to deal with outpatients and how to treat outpatients safely without exposing them to your COVID-positive population, uh, how to uh, address the telemedicine concern in your given district or area, and how to prepare for it, and how to document it uh, adequately, how to come back from retirement and volunteer, how to set yourself up to learn more and work more uh, in congruence with your colleagues if you aren't an expert at critical care and how to contribute to acute care. We also talked about um, setting up your ICU and setting up your operating room and setting up your wards uh, for these purposes, converting wards into isolation wards with clean zones and contaminated zones, setting up a runner-based system, so that you keep your operating room lounge and your stock rooms nice and clean. And then we talked about ICU for beginners, your personal protective equipment, uh, OR prep again, ward prep, and intubation, white belt to blue belt level, hemodynamics. So what are hemodynamics? What are abnormal hemodynamics? Why are they important? And how to address them? What vasopressors are? Then we talked about guidelines, what are our endpoints, what the current data supports and why it supports it. We talked about lung mechanics very briefly, why we think that COVID is like ARDS, why we think that COVID is not like ARDS. Uh, what are the risks in not being aggressive about intubation in terms of mortality risk? What is the cost of being aggressive about intubation in terms of number of free ventilators, overall resource allocation, and overall patient outcomes? Uh, how significant the, high, the happy hypoxemic hypothesis is uh, in the context of uh, data from other countries, and what the phenotypes really are, in addition to basics and fundamentals of compliance, resistance, uh, pressure volume curves, differences in pressure volume curves that are pathological. We talked about ventilation as a primer, what controlled modes of ventilations are, what assisted controls of ventilations are, what what. CMV looks like and why it shouldn't be used and what other ventilation strategies can be used. We then talked about troubleshooting ventilators uh, to an extent that 2 a.m. phone call that you can get and how to deal with a ventilator when it's on your physical medical non-ICU floor, which is a contingency that we've had to prepare for. 
Lastly, but not least, we talked about mental health, how I forgot to emphasize multidisciplinary care, or maybe should have emphasized it more, I think, in hindsight. Um, how to take care of yourself uh, during the current uh, COVID situation and how to move forward from it. And really, this is a white belt to white belt discussion here, man. Like, I know as much as you guys do over there, but I tried to do my best to ask smart people, and I came up with a paradigm for it. But there's one more thing that we should address. Well, two more things. The first thing is that you need to bring all of these things together into key concepts. And the key concepts, I would say, are, number one, your mental health. Number two, the logistics of the hospital and who's handling them. Number three, the active clinical care and how to address the hemodynamic component, the respiratory component, and how to keep yourself up to date and modify your practice on a daily basis, given the amount of information that we have to process and all the new findings that we have on uh, COVID-19-based pathologies. From there, the last part that I want to talk about is codes. So uh, the reason why I kept this for last is because it's the thing that scares people the most in terms of, number one, getting infected, but also, number two, preparing for them. Because codes are always things that, that are high-stress situations for people who don't love acute care. And I would contend that we're built for this. Inherently, we're built for this. Uh, I can't explain it, but uh, here's my theory. When you applied for medical school, your personal straight statement or your interview process made you admit the fact that you like to help people and you want to save a life. The same thing if you went through nursing school. In fact, more so nursing interviews, I've noticed, and personal statements there. The same thing for physiotherapists, for allied health professionals. We've all had to express the concern of saving a life and having an impact on our patients' lives. There is nothing more extreme than a code is when it comes to that that need, that, that, that almost inherent need in every single one of you listening, especially if you have an acute care background. However, over time, we've recognized or we felt that we've had strengths and weaknesses. Some of our strengths, as an example, may be the ability to perform kidney transplants. Some of our strengths may be the ability to perform heart transplants. Some of our strengths may be the ability to run a dermatology clinic with 600 patients a day. Some of our strengths may be to provide social support and mental health support. Some of our strengths may be in setting up back slabs and casts, hammering and nails. And some of our strengths are obviously in acute care. Because of these strengths and some respective weaknesses, for example, as you've seen, my weaknesses in mental health, we develop a liking for specialties along the way as part of our training and our apprenticeship. That's what makes healthcare unique. The education in healthcare is what I would call intrinsic education. And by education, I mean the development of a nuanced mental process right? It, it's actually something that is inherent in you. It's, it's, it's inside you, right? It's almost instinctual that you're attracted to parts that make it easy for you. And so therefore, with time, that instinct, that, that acute care instinct in many of us, not all of us, but in many of us, becomes like a vestigial organ. And we're extremely uncomfortable with it. We, are, we become extremely uncomfortable with codes because somewhere along the line, we've decided that we're experts at putting in kidneys and we're not experts at CPR. And because we're not experts at CPR, we should be afraid of it. This is the time for you to shine. This is the time for you to relive those medical student memories, those fantasies that you had. And this is the time for you to do it right. Now, there's been a lot of talk about whether we should withhold codes on COVID-19 patients and not. We are not going to talk about end-of-life discussions because that's beyond my scope and that's beyond this scope. It should be handled on a case-by-case basis, in my opinion, and ultimately it should be something that's based on the local jurisdiction and the hospital involved. But generally speaking, try not to have a code. This means intubating early and safely when you're thinking about intubating, resuscitating appropriately, providing pre-planning and having the discussion early, about, say, limitations of care or goals of care, providing drills to make everybody comfortable with coding patients. But when you have to go, 
you go. You do not dilly dally. You do not think twice. When you see somebody who's peri arrest or arresting, and they are a quote unquote full coat, they are allowed to have maximal measures based on overall prognosis and based on the discussion with the patient or their next of kin or legal representative or guardian. Then go, explode, do the right thing, or what would be deemed the right thing in that context. But remember, safety first. Now, six months ago, this poster would have made sense. I realize now it was a poor choice. I should have put one meter between each one of them. But there you go. Safety first and safety begins with teamwork. The more you drill, the more you look out for each other during these high stress situations, the better it is. Now, the actual technical aspects of coding, whether it's ACLS or ATLS, have not changed much for COVID patients, but the American Heart Association have made some changes, and those changes center around limiting the amount of aerosolized exposure from the airway. So the American Heart Association feels very strongly that mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing is not there for BLS, and I agree with that statement, and that uh, tight bag mask ventilation should be an adjunct until you can get something more invasive done. By something more invasive, both in ACLS and in BLS, the discussion centered around using LMAs versus intubation. I'm a very big fan of intubating early in these cases and preparing to intubate early. Obviously, personal protective equipment is key whenever you're in a patient patient's room. The maximum amount that you can be authorized to use based on current recommendations, which may have changed after this talk. The only key differences in BLS and ACLS are PPE and the airway. Okay, now we're really done, for now at least. Um, please stay tuned uh, for other episodes. Thank you for listening and being patient. Thank you for all the feedback. And uh, for the live sessions that I've managed to do with uh, various different associations, it's been an honor. And um, obviously, uh, you know, I think that everybody around the world is learning new things on a daily basis. And my sense is, and my hope is that um, we come up with a more streamlined approach than we do, than we have right now, and our outcomes are better by the end of this. And listen, hang in there. Um, we're all experiencing it. We're all going through it. This is Saud Al-Zaid, and thank you for listening.